Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to call the meeting of the Citizens Advisory Committee to order. Um, in addition, um, acknowledgement of the Open Meetings Act, I do have a, a governor's disaster declaration that I'll have to um, state prior to our meeting. So I, I will make that announcement now. So as uh, permitted by the governor's disaster declaration of August 21st, 2020, the determination has been made that in-person meeting is not practical or prudent for this committee to meet in person. To ensure a transparent and open meeting as possible, we will post the meeting materials approximately one week in advance. We will provide a recording of this meeting linked on the YouTube page and we will take votes by roll call. And so uh, just to uh, mention, we are recording this meeting. Uh, the meeting will be uh, available to all members um, on our YouTube page. And so we have a playlist available for uh, Citizen Advisory Committee recordings, as well as other committee meetings, and that is online. And so those will be posted um, shortly after this meeting. So um, at this time, I would like to combine the attendance um, roll call with the approval of the June, uh, the June 9th minutes. And so uh, at first I'd like to get a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes of the Citizens Advisory Committee meeting. And so could you please state your name and say so moved. Garland Armstrong, Armstrong so, moved. so moved. Second. Garland. Garland Armstrong, second. Thank you. Moved by Heather and second by Garland. Okay. Wonderful. Are there any questions from the members? Um, if there are no questions, we will move to roll call. All right, great. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so I'm just gonna run through the list. Um, stay present if you are here. Uh, Elliot Hartstein. <laughs> Garland Armstrong. Present. Um, and also, when you state your name, can you please say yay or nay, or abstain on the minutes when you call your name, please? Yay. Thank you. Heather Armstrong? Here, yes. Lulu Blackstone? Here, yes. Thomas Gary? Present and yes. Chris P? No. Uh, Daniel Honigman? Present. Kevin Ivers? Renee Patton? Present, yes. Stephanie, and oh, I'm going to screw up your last name, I'm sorry. Um, Stephanie? Stephanie Pressler? Ruth Rosas? Present, yay. Ben Rulig. Faye Sinop. And Zara Stewart Wall. Present, yes. Great. Thanks, everyone. Great. Um, so I believe we have a quorum to approve the minutes. Um, so thank you everybody for um, being present today. We'll now get started uh, by first um, introducing our two newest members to the committee. Uh, we first would like to welcome Daniel and Zara. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and introduce yourselves to the committee. Uh, thank you for joining us and, and welcome. Zara, did you want to go first? If not, I can go. Um, sure, go ahead, Daniel. All right. 
Hi everyone, I'm uh, Daniel Honigman. Um, I live in Chicago and I am ha happy to be a part of this uh, committee. I would do video, but we're doing a little bit of construction in my basement, so I have a bunch of stuff uh, surrounding me at the moment, so not the prettiest uh, Zoom picture. A um, little, a little bit about myself. I am on the, um, the board of the Horner Park Advisory Council, among other things. I've been involved in, you know, when I lived in the West Loop, neighbors of West Loop. Uh, I work for part of Accenture, where I specialize in sort of digital strategy and advisory type work um, for both. Uh, I guess digital customer engagements as well as digital workplace engagements. Um, you know, it's it's funny because when I reached out to CMAP about participating in the committee, um, I did so via Twitter and I saw a message I had sent about 10 years ago asking about the 2040 initiative for, for something else. So that's sort of come full circle and I'm uh, um, I'm excited to be part of this committee. Um, hi everyone, I'm Zara Surawala. Um, I live in Elmhurst and I am an adjunct professor at um, ECC. Uh, I teach uh, English comp and um, I'm also the co-founder of a book series called I Speak For Myself. And um, I'm also running for the DuPage County Board at the moment. So um, that is keeping me pretty busy. <laughs> um, I'm also uh, on the board of um, a nonprofit car called Progressives for Change here in Elmhurst and also the Elmhurst Pride Collective. Um, and I'm happy to be a part of this, uh, this committee. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Zara. It's such a pleasure to have you both today. And um, we look forward to having you all uh, participate in the committee moving forward. So uh, moving right along to the next order of business, we have a presentation by Tina on CMAP's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiatives. Hello, everybody. It's uh, very nice to see you all. Welcome to new members. Um, I have uh, been at, at CAC meetings before and introduced myself in my role, but just to introduce myself again, uh, my name is Tina Fassett-Smith. I'm the Director of Innovation and Strategic Alignment at CMAP. I've been with the agency for five and a half years. Previously, um, I directed communications. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about our internal diversity, equity, and inclusion work at CMAP. Um, and if you wanna to go to the next slide, Michelle, I will go through our agenda. Real quickly, I'll just explain my role, the recent timeline of our DEI activities, how they fit in with our core values of an, as an agency, and our commitment and goals uh, that we've made so far uh, in our work. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, my title is Director of Innovation and Strategic Alignment. That is a role that was created by our new Executive Director, Erin Alman, and her Chief of Staff, Amy McGowan. And it is new to the agency, and it has kind of three main uh, uh, functions. Uh, it sits within the Executive Department, and one of the main functions is to guide agency development of a comprehensive program to support and advance inclusion and equity, as well as the external facing focus on inclusive growth. For those of you who uh, may not be as familiar with ONTU 2050, the long range plan that the region adopted in 2018, inclusive growth, which represents the idea that we all do better as a region when opportunity is available to all of our residents, is one of the three core principles of the plan, and uh, along with resilience and prioritized investment, and has maintained a, a key focus uh, of the agency's external work uh, since the plan was, was uh, developed. So this role uh, includes training programs that are internal, internal policies and practices, and the communications that we use to implement our core value of pursue equity. Now this is, our core values are different than the principles for ONTO 2050. Our core values were, were uh, voted on and developed by our staff in 2019 to um, guide our internal work and to um, help us make decisions on external work too. If you wanna go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll go through all those core values in just a moment because they are really important to our DEI work. But first, just to talk a little bit about our recent DEI timeline. Um, so I wanna emphasize that this is just a, a capsulization of our recent work. Um, the work of 
building an inclusive um, agency and of being um, equitable in our hiring practices ha has been going on uh, long before 2016 since our, our um, agency was founded. But in 2016, a very important thing happened in that our internal uh, internal diversity and inclusion working group was developed and this was a core group it's changed in numbers through the time it's grown from about um, six or seven folks to about 35 different uh, members of staff um, this is a group that's committed to building an internal uh, culture of diversity and inclusion and holding the agency accountable for that as well in 2018 the diversity and inclusion working group adopted a formal charter and in 2019, as I mentioned, as an agency, we adopted a set of core values. My role was created within the executive office. And that's really led us to where we are today, which is um, the development of a two-year internal diversity, equity, and inclusion work plan, which really has goals and tasks that focus our efforts on um, revising policies and making sure that we're being equitable in all of our internal work. We've also uh, joined a government organization called the Government Alliance for Race and Equity. This allows us to share best practices with other government agencies across the country on external and internal equity initiatives. In June, our board uh, made a statement reaffirming our commitment to both inclusive growth and racial equity. And um, tomorrow, in fact, Erin, uh, our executive director, and myself will present to our board on continuing our work on um, external facing equity initiatives. Uh, next slide, Michelle. But just to go through our core values because they are such a really important part of how we function as an agency. So in 2019, uh, when um, Aaron was uh, chosen by the board to be our executive director, um, we had at that time a set of values um, that we used, but they were a bit outdated and our staff had turned over many times since they were first created. And so we went through an engagement process where we as a staff um, voted on what our, we thought our values should be and um, how we might use them. I'm just gonna walk through, there's five of them, I'm just gonna walk through them really quickly. The first is serve with passion. We are passionate about serving the people of metropolitan Chicago. We build public trust by being good stewards of public resources and proactively sharing information. Next. We lead with excellence. We lead on issues that advance the region. We believe in the power of data and the story it tells. We identify and share solutions and inspire others to adapt them for their communities. Next. We drive innovation. We're driven by the desire to find more efficient methods to achieve the most impact. We do this by seeking new solutions to old problems, taking calculated risks, and daring to try them. We foster collaboration. We believe inclusion and collaboration strengthens our work. We seek out the voices of those who often go unheard or face barriers to public participation and pursue equity. We are guided by the principle that everyone has a right to opportunity and a high quality of life. We work to realize equity for all. So one of the things I think that's important about the core values is that we very much intend them to be aspirational, not descriptive. We wanted uh, a set of values that we had to work towards that didn't feel easy um, and that would challenge our staff and that we could use in making difficult decisions um, about how we wanted to um, pursue work, how we wanted to staff, uh, how we wanted to uh, present ourselves to the public. And one of the things that we thought was really important too is to share these values with our committees, share these values with prospective candidates for employment and make sure that um, you know, we, were, we were being as, as transparent as possible about the, the values that we as a staff decided uh, to help guide us. Let me go to the next slide. So through the, the first eight months in my role um, in this position, um, I've met with a lot of staff, I've met with our diversity and inclusion working group, I've talked to many, many, many uh, consultants and facilitators in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of other professionals working at metropolitan planning organizations or MPOs across the country about how they're uh, approaching this work. And of course, I've had uh, conversations with uh, our executive director and our chief of staff uh, and our other managers about what they would like to see happen um, and uh, we've made the following commitments and set the following goals for ourselves in the near term 
So one of them is to do continual and mandatory trainings, prioritizing and include building an inclusive culture, prioritizing professional growth for our all of our staff and really focusing on developing management skills that allow our managers to develop an atmosphere where each of our employees can show up at work as their authentic self and contribute as their authentic self. We have committed to, to doing a training per quarter, so our, you know, per, uh, four times a year, um, and uh, to do that with a variety of different facilitators and consultants and to do that live or remote as the case may be and not rely on prepackaged trainings. Um, we've held uh, two of these trainings so far since we since COVID hit and we've been remote, which was um, you know challenging to put together at first, but has um, I think we've done the best that we can with it. And one of those trainings, um, we had a training of a few months ago on disrupting anti-blackness in the workplace that was focused on our, our managers and some core leaders among our seniors and our um, diversity and inclusion working group. And um, that was a very purposeful uh, training um, meant to do exactly that, um, to learn skills um, as a team about just specifically supporting our, our black employees and, and black residents and black communities. Another thing that we have done is begun a review of internal practices so that we can operationalize our equity focus in recruitment, in hiring, in evaluations, in pay, and in promotions. We understand that with all of this work, it's not uh, going to happen tomorrow. This is a, our, our internal practices took many, many years to develop and will take many years to, uh, probably to perfect uh, if we ever get there. But uh, starting with our core values and starting with with some uh, specific goals we have begun that process and and uh, welcomed a new director of human resources um, a few weeks ago who will lead that effort um, as i mentioned we also think it's important to engage with local and national government organizations who are leading on equity so that we can learn from them an important part of this is our uh, membership in the government alliance on race and uh, equity but we also um, through our own individual channels um, and our own relationships with other mpos are reaching out and learning about what other um, government organizations like us are doing both internally and externally go to the next slide please so I want to talk a little bit about inclusive growth, which I mentioned is uh, one of the principles of ONTU 2050 that really focuses on eliminating barriers and obstacles for all um, of our residents in the, in the CMAP region to participate economically. So uh, one of the things in our, in our current work plan um, that we also uh, developed as a staff were, were three focus areas that we really wanted to hone in on in implementation of ONTU 2050. They include transportation and the need to fund the transportation system, climate uh, adaptation and mitigation, focusing mostly on the transportation system and how it can be used to mitigate uh, climate change and regional economic competitiveness. Each of these three focus areas are currently engaged in multi-year planning with a renewed focus on equity and implementation of the inclusive growth principle, which really has emerged of the three I mentioned, resilience, prioritized investment uh, and inclusive growth as the one, we feel uh, they're all important. They all require uh, focus, but inclusive growth uh, at, as, our, as our region continues to um, suffer from new challenges like COVID-19 and the economic impacts of it, we find that implementation of inclusive growth uh, in particular requires renewed uh, focus on our part. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so with that, I realize I just gave a lot of information, but I, I am always interested when talking to our committees about what DEI topics, what diversity, equity, and inclusion topics or initiatives do you think it's important that we consider? Um, perhaps in your own organizations or your own uh, life, you uh, are to are engaged in this work or um, have been in the past or just particularly because of your knowledge of CMAP, uh, see that there are areas where we need to improve or where you, you think that we could improve. Um, I'm happy to take questions about any of the things I presented, but would be always uh, interested in, in your perspective on things that we should be considering. Thank you. Tina, I have a quick question. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm um, on the board of the Elmhurst Pride Collective and their mission is very similar to what you outlined as the DEI sort of mission statement. 
I'm wondering if I could, you know, like the first few slides that you presented where you kind of talked about, like you fleshed out, serve the public, lead with excellence, drive innovation, like all of those, um, kind of the, the bullet points on those. Is there any way that um, I could maybe get those slides from you and then also share them with the EPC only because since the, the mission statements are so similar, I feel like there could be some sort of like crosstalk. Um, the, the EPC mostly serves the, city, the suburb of Elmhurst, but um, I feel like there could be some sort of organic, um, you know, pollination there, cross-pollination. Absolutely. So we, we consider those core values a, a external, like an important thing that we want all of our partners and communities to be aware of. So I'm more than happy to share those slides. Yes, I have a concern about like, and this is about housing. Okay. Because like in Des Moines, it's very easy in the Des Moines area in Central Iowa. It's very easy to get housing. Whereas mm -hmm. here in the Chicago area, it's very hard to get housing, except for like McHenry County, because the property values here are so high. Whereas mm -hmm. even if you're a middle middle class citizen, you can't afford you cannot even afford housing in the area. Mm -hmm. Unless if you make like fifty thousand. So you may need to check to see how Des Moines is, the mm -hmm. Des Moines area is, has housing for low income people, for people that make under 36,000. So you need to check see what they're doing and we need to take what they're doing and bring it back here to Chicago so people could get housing here in the Chicago area because it seems like the problem is, is that the housing is so expensive and the cheapest apartment you could get in the Chicago area is like, I'm going to say like 1500 and that's for a little tiny studio. Mm -hmm. so other, we, yes? Oh, I was going to say, looking at how other regions uh, deal with these issues is a really important part of mm -hmm. the work that we do. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions, Bettina, or comments? Okay. Um, great. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, I believe the last slide has your contact information as well. It does, and I, I am happy to have any comments that people think of at any other time. We'll uh, be engaged in this work for a long time, so hopefully I'll come back to your committee with updates in the future. Thank you, Thank Tina. Great. So um, our next presentation will be on the Future Leaders in Planning program, which I'll be giving. Um, this year, I was one of the co-directors for the program, along with Courtney Barnes. And um, in seeing that our theme for this committee meeting is on equity, I'd like to spend some time talking about some of the themes from this year, uh, some of the topics we focused on, and how we utilize equity in the way we um, and the way we program um, flip for this year. So uh, next slide, please. So um, I'll just like to provide some background on the Future Leaders in Planning program. So um, FLIP, um, also known as FLIP, has been in existence for about 12 years. Um, it's CMAT's premier program for youth engagement. And FLIP's ultimate goal is to grow the pipeline of urban planners. So in past years, the program has targeted high school students from across the seven counties CMAP services. And students were brought into the CMAP office for a one week program, um, typically in the summer month of July, to learn about some theme or topic related to urban planning principles. Um, unfortunately, due to the concerns surrounding COVID, we were unable to hold in-person events. And so FLIP has gone completely virtual for this year. And this was the first time in its 12 year history to do a completely virtual program. And so our main goal uh, was to ensure that this program was just as engaging as it had been in past years. And so we wanted to expand the program to offer high school and college age students with an opportunity to attend this year's program. So with that, uh, we had elected to have a four week program that included a weekly 60 to 90 minute live stream sessions via Zoom. Um, in addition, we also, um, 
allowed students to um, learn new topics related to urban planning. And so each week um, presented a different topic related to urban planning. We invited guest speakers from regional planning agencies, community activists, as well as leaders in the nonprofit sector. In addition uh, to the live sessions, the FLIP team also had a dedicated FLIP engagement page where students had access to pre-session assignments and uh, they were of course asked to complete them before the sessions. The FLIP page also included different games and activities which all served as an opportunity for students to engage with one another. Uh, lastly, our collaboration with uh, a regional planning organization, um, and this was the Atlanta Regional Commission, served as a huge success for FLIP this year. This was the first time we collaborated with the regional planning agency, and we had over 30 students participate from their model Atlanta Regional Commission program, which is such a fantastic opportunity for students from Chicago and Atlanta to meet with one another and engage on topics related to inequities in urban planning. Uh, next slide, please. And so, um, as you can see here, here are the, uh, the four sessions for this year. Um, as I mentioned, we had four unique sessions that focused on a theme related to urban planning. And so our first session, uh, Planning for Urban Street Festivals, we invited Eric Williams from the Silver Room Block Party. Um, he is the founder of this uh, very well-known block party that's held in Hyde Park um, each summer. Uh, we used this session to talk about um, how you plan for an urban street festival. In addition, how um, urban street festivals can be used as a tool for social change. Our second week, which focused on the truth about drinking water, we invited Nora Beck from CMAP, as well as Dan Cooper from the Metropolitan uh, Planning Council to discuss uh, water resource management. We particularly focused on equity um, and how certain communities are unfortunately don't have access to, to proper drinking water, um, how oftentimes the cost of water is even more than the cost of living in certain areas. And so that was a fantastic uh, opportunity to talk about equity as it relates to water resource management. Um, our third session, planning amid COVID-19, we invited an urban planner from a Morton Groves planning department. Her name was Zora Heidorn. And we also um, had a representative from the Regional Transportation Authority, Peter Farenhall, Farenwall, excuse me, to discuss um, the impact COVID has had on urban planning and, and development. Uh, finally, our last session, Inequities in Urban Planning. Uh, we, uh, of course, collaborated with the Atlanta Regional Commission for this session, but we invited Tanika Johnson from the Folded Map Project to talk about her work uh, in doing um, her Map Twins project. Um, in addition to that, we had a cross-regional uh, panel discussion on housing discrimination in urban planning. And so that was our, our fourth and final session. Uh, moving on to the next slide. And so um, I am providing you all with a, a few um, images of the FLIP engagement page. So as I mentioned, we had a dedicated engagement page for students to dig deeper into the concepts they were learning during the live sessions. So each week students were provided with pre-session content that included articles and videos about a topic they would learn during the live session. So for example, at the very bottom of this uh, screen, you can see at the right-hand corner, there is a water affordability dashboard. So that's one example of an assignment we had students complete prior to session two, which was uh, the truth about drinking water. We had students look on, um, on this water affordability dashboard, analyze the cost of water as it relates to the cost of living. And we had a very enriching conversation about inequities in, in water resource management. And so that's one example of um, some of the assignments we had students do prior to the session. Uh, lastly, we had surveys, polls, and discussion boards for students to engage with on the website. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, in, in this example, we have um, a few examples of some of the activities we had students engage with. So uh, at the very top, we, one of the questions we asked students on the page was, um, show us a picture of your favorite body of water. And so we had a student uh, take a picture of a lagoon in Australia and talk about why that was her favorite body of water. We also had questions about uh, neighborhood um, access to resources. We asked students to plan their own urban street festival. Uh, we asked them to talk about um, a street festival that's near and dear to their hearts. 
And at the very bottom, you can see um, in one question, we asked students to share their experience, um, uh, share a favorite, a favorite memory of a, of a body of water. And we had over 300 students respond to that. So as you can see, um, we had so many students engaging in this flip page. And I definitely think it was a, a great um, asset to have this page along with the, the live sessions we had for this year's flip program. Uh, next slide. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly go over some highlights from this year's program. So we had over 130 students register for the program, but we averaged about 60 um, participants per week, um, which is typically normal given that this was a, a free um, and open registration program. Um, so we were expecting to, to get those numbers, but um, each week we averaged about 60 in attendance. We had four counties represented um, in this year's program. And we of course had uh, the collaboration with the Atlanta Regional Commission, which brought over 30 students to our final session. And then uh, finally, we had about 50% of students participating on that flip engagement page each week. Next slide. And so um, we, at the, at the culmination, at the, at the very end, excuse me, of our, our program, we sent out a survey to students to to gauge their understanding of the concepts they learned this year and whether or not they had any recommendations for us uh, for, for next year's program. And so um, here are some of the responses we got from students. Uh, we'll start off by saying that 90% of students stated that FLIP increased their understanding of urban planning. 100% of students said they would recommend FLIP to other students for next year. And um, one of the most, um, common themes we got from the responses is that students wanted to, to meet more students um, during the live session. So I think moving forward, we definitely want to incorporate more opportunities for students to in, engage with one another during uh, the live sessions. And um, I have some comments from students below. And so when we ask students to share um, a takeaway um, from last year's or from this year's program, um, one student stated, uh, and if you can go back to the previous slide, um, and just so I'll just share. That's all right. I'll just share the, um, the first comment. Um, when asked about a takeaway from this year's split program, one student stated that there are a lot of factors and responsibilities in city planning. The possibilities and challenges are endless. Problem solving, communication with the city, and prioritization of needs are key. And so that's just one example of what um, students could gain from this year's programming. And we were incredibly fortunate to get this, these responses from the students. Next slide. And so um, I'll end off with some takeaways. So um, in, in moving forward and planning for next year's program, we definitely want to incorporate a virtual component. Um, as I mentioned, the FLIP engagement page uh, was fantastic. And we had so many students engaging on that page on a weekly basis. So moving forward, we definitely want to have a dedicated page for students to have access to, even if we choose to have a live, a live in-person session or live in-person program. Um, we also would like to potentially reinstate the application process. As I mentioned earlier, uh, registration was open to high school and college students. And so all students had to do was go on our website and register. We may uh, go back to a formalized application process just to ensure that the, the same students are coming back each week and that they are dedicated to participating. Since we had over 130 students registered, only about 60 were attending each week. Um, we hope that in having a more formal application process, we will have a consistent number each week and we'll have the same students that register also participate. Um, we also would like to collaborate with another metropolitan planning organization. Our collaboration with uh, the Atlanta Regional Commission was a wonderful opportunity to meet with students from Atlanta but we may choose to um, co uh, collaborate with another regional planning agency in another state. Um, we have also thought about having a smaller cohort. Uh, typically, FLIP has had about 40 students attend. Uh, this year, we had about 60 each week. So uh, we're thinking maybe to keep things uh, you know, consistent, we might go back to 40 um, as, a, as a cohort for um, upcoming years. Um, additionally, we thought about professional development opportunities or potentially a civic engagement project. Uh, we think it, 
it's a great opportunity for students to apply what they're learning in flip to real world examples. So incorporating some sort of civic engagement opportunity at the very end may, shoot, may seem to be the best option for students to engage in, in the concept that they're learning um, during flip. And then uh, finally, uh, we've talked about a formalized curriculum for flip. Um, I think moving forward, it, it might be helpful to um, communicate with the consultant to discuss opportunities to develop FLIP as a formalized program for years to come. And so those were the, uh, our key takeaways for this year as we plan for next year. Um, this was such a great opportunity to meet with students from across the region. And uh, we are very fortunate to have had this opportunity to, to host FLIP this year. So if you have any questions for myself or Courtney, please feel free to reach out to us. I will also drop the link to our FLIP page so that you're able to, to check out our website. And uh, thank you, and I, I'm happy to take questions as well. Oh, thanks for that. What was like the backend software or like development stuff you used for the online engagement piece? We used a website called Engagement HQ. And so um, we were able to actually set up our FLIP page using that site. Uh, we have used that site in the past for uh, different LTA projects, but we were def definitely able to dedicate FLIP to that for this year, which was great. I had a question about the engagement questions that you all chose. Did you and Courtney typically come up with those for the polls and the surveys and the assignments, or did you have some other um, team members who were maybe teachers or worked with youth in the other capacity? Yeah, so we had a fantastic team this year to help us with FLIP. Um, we had about eight colleagues from CMET. Um, two colleagues were leading each session, and so um, we collaborated with them to come up with questions that we'd asked on the FLIP engagement page. And so um, this helps students to go on the flip page ahead of the session, complete those assignments, and then come to the session already prepared with questions and knowledge of what they've already learned on that flip page. So we definitely def had support as well. All right, if there aren't any more questions, this will move right along to our next presentation, um, which is um, on walkability and equity. We have Ruth Rosas, who will be presenting today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruth uh, Rosas. I work at the Consortium to Lower Obesity in Chicago Children, which is a program that's housed at uh, Lurie Children's Hospital. So um, Lurie's divided into the clinical side and the non-clinical side where we do a lot of community um, community and research work. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so CLOCK was founded in 2002 and it's a consortium of basically a bunch of organizations that are trying to prevent childhood obesity. Um, Chicago has high obesity rates compared to the rest of the nation. So that's kind of where this work came from. Uh, we do a lot of work in neighborhoods, typically at the neighborhood level, but we also do some um, city and state uh, and national advocacy. Um, and the primary focus of our work is prevention of obesity because we know that um, childhood obesity can cause a lot of um, health issues, both physical and emotional. And then um, children who have obesity, their risk for um, other diseases increases um, and their their diseases are more likely to be severe um, as they get older. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see here that the national obesity trends in the U.S. have somewhat um, fluctuated, uh, but mostly been consistently going up. Um, as we delve deeper into this work, we've noticed that there's obviously racial and ethnic um, trends that also occur. Uh, basically, um, only white people uh, have obesity rates that are declining and everybody else, um, Asian, Hispanic, Black, um, the obesity rates are going up. Next slide. So in Chicago, we see this 
uh, being these obesity rates basically replicating every map that we know of Chicago, where the concentrations of childhood obesity are located in the west and south sides. Um, uh, we, when we do, so part of our work or my work is really focusing on, um, in terms of the built environment and how it affects obesity. And I'll kind of get into that. But when we go with communities, we kind of show them these maps and talk about what they see and how they see this reflected. So a lot of what we talk about is, um, you know, communities will tell us like they, they see environmental differences between living in the west side or south sides um, or northwest sides compared to living, you know, north or in central area. And so, for example, we talk a lot about the disparities in our, in our environment. So, for example, Lincoln Park in Chicago has the lowest obesity rate. Um, childhood obesity rate and CPS, it has 11.5%. Um, I don't know why I put Woodlawn, it should say, uh, that should not say Woodlawn, <laughs> that should say South Lawndale. Um, but South Lawndale has the highest obesity rate in Chicago at 32%. Can we go to the next slide, please? So when we focus on, when we say we are trying to address obesity prevention, we have this ecological approach, right? Where it's, we know that affecting the individual creates changes, but they're small. Um, and as you go further out, you kind of impact more things. So at the individual level, we do, we do focus on the individual level. Like for example, we have a health educator who does nutrition classes. Um, we support after school. Um, you know, physical activity things. And then we also s support like families who might do um, we parenting classes or anything around um, programs involving like youth and adults together. But uh, we really do focus on community and we try to focus on societal things. For example, we do do a lot of advocacy work and um, focus on policy and systems as they relate to health usually, uh, for, you know, like, examples of ordinances are like the soda tax, like whether we support something like that. And if you do support something like that, how is it um, being equitably distributed, right? Like how do we, which making sure that we're not impacting communities that are already being impacted by other things. Um, so we re, uh, the big part of my job is focusing on the built or like the physical environment. Um, and the big focus is to support physical activity. We know that um, making improvements to the physical em environment is beneficial for other things as well. So we try to look at all of those intersections. So we're not, you know, we're talking about like, how do people improve their lifestyle to become healthier? Um, whether it be like changing zone, like code um, zoning codes in certain neighborhoods, um, a lot of the support that we do or advocacy work that we do is really motivated or driven by the community. Um, they kind of tell us what they are thinking. And so we evaluate a lot of the decisions that we make based on the work that we've already done with them. Um, we also do a lot of support around food access. So, um, you know, for example, changing food retail culture or um, food production, um, like urban farms and things like that. So that's some of the work that we do. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about this environment uh, matters with communities, we do talk a lot about the inequalities or inequities that are exist in our environment. This isn't something that the community, it's new to the communities, but we often try to put like a language for it so that when they are driving this, these advocacy efforts, they know what we're talking about and what we support because sometimes there's a lack of knowledge in terms of the words that people are using. Some of the, you know, I worked with North Lawndale last year a lot and one of the biggest things that people told me was I, now I know what you know, when the Chicago Department of Transportation comes and does certain things in my neighborhood, now I know what they're doing. Um, because they would tell me, what is this for? I don't understand why they're adding this. It looks like they're just tearing up the street. Why would they add this here and not here? And so putting that language around what is happening has been really um, helpful for communities. And that's driven some of the change that has happened. And so we do talk about disparities, for example, in median household income, 
Um, again, South Lawndale has the highest obesity rate, childhood obesity rate. Um, Lincoln Park has the lowest, and you can tell median income. Not only that, but um, access to parks, we focus a lot on that. And um, South Lawndale has the lowest um, green space, space uh, in all of Chicago um, compared to other neighborhoods. Now, these things are compounded, right? We're not saying that this is causing this other thing, but we know that they are correlated somehow. Um, and so we try to focus, or we try to show people how those things happen. Next slide. The other thing we talk a lot about, um, or the work that we do is Vision Zero, um, which again, Vision Zero, if you look at a Vision Zero map of high crash areas or high crash corridors, so where people are getting hit by cars or dying, um, serious injury, a lot of the, the maps look very similar um, to the obesity map that I showed. And um, we also know that pedestrian fatalities have been increasing. And so while the number of people who are dying or severely injured in um, car crashes, right? So like, for example, um, people hitting other cars, their rates are going, are decreasing. Um, the number of pedestrians being killed by cars is rising. Um, and I think it's somewhere around 5,000 Americans are killed in traffic um, while walking every year. And we also know that there's racial disparities to this. So um, in certain areas, people of color are some, something like nine times more likely to be killed while walking than white people. So the, obviously this is again, a built environment issue. And we try to address those inequities because in Vision Zero, they come up often. Um, in Chicago, it's no different than the rest of the nation. Um, the next slide. So uh, we also have noticed, you know, the ways that people travel in community, in certain communities. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I've had conversations with people around, for example, like parking when we do my work really talks about um, what people perceive as walkable. And so if, you know, if people, you can have all the amenities in the world in a place, right? The roads could be beautiful, the sidewalks could be perfectly paved, but if people don't feel comfortable walking, they're going to take a car. So that's kind of what has happened. And we tried to illuminate that um, by talking about how people are walking less and driving more. Um, even though traffic deaths are, you know, coming down. So there's a lot of inequities there. Um, next slide. So what we do with communities is actually a walkability assessment. So we take them out um, in neighborhood, in the area of the neighborhood that they chose. Um, usually it's a group of people. We've had like groups of parents or we've had community-based organizations come to us and ask us. And um, we assess a, intersection block area. Um, sometimes we'll do a vast area. For example, in Chinatown, they did every single block and intersection in Chinatown and they collected data. And so we have a mobile app where people are able to answer questions. Um, they'll actually specifically look at every crosswalk and answer questions about what they perceive. So it's a user um, survey, like a user-based survey where it's their perception about that area. Um, and it talks a lot about uh, whether they think that cars are behaving in dangerous ways, how they feel, is there harassment, is there safety? And we take them out and we walk them through this whole process. And from that, we're able to um, come up with an action plan where we're able to advocate um, for changes. Next slide. So um, the walkability, I, I talked about North Lawndale last year, we worked with them, they come out, came out with this booklet um, called Walk Age and it's their vision for creating a more walkable North Lawndale. And again, we went through this process of um, assessing, evaluating the conditions of walking routes, identifying um, what strengths and barriers there are, diagnosing the problem and then taking action. And so from this, um, they're working with the Chicago Department of Transportation to some projects around um, making transit and walking more um, cohesive, right? And also trying to uh, improve some of the areas because what we've noticed is that Chicago Department of Transportation some, sometimes doesn't do the engagement that they should and creates 
um, projects that sometimes the community does not see as helpful. So we're trying to kind of bridge that gap. Next slide. Um, so this is some of our work right now. We're really focusing on the social determinants of childhood obesity. Some people, you know, know this as a um, social determinants of health. Um, and we're looking at the in intersection of the built environment and um, obesity. Um, we're also working with Elevated Chicago. Uh, we have a whole project with parks right now called Activating Neighborhoods for Health and Wellness, Vision Zero. Um, we do a variety of work. And a lot of it is focused on this idea of how do we make walking more equitable in Chicago and making sure that people don't need to rely on a car if they don't need to, if they don't want to, uh, making sure that they're safe while they're walking. And then, um, you know, hopefully they're able to engage in more physical activity through these things. Um, so next slide. Yeah, that's me. If you have any questions, let me know. But um, happy to talk to anybody about walkability. Um, if they're interested. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, I believe we have time for a couple questions. Yes, like, Mike, is, I'm just surprised that like the black communities have like a whole ton of um, obesity. When you think of the white people that have like the rich white people, you would think that they would have been the most at peace because they're the ones that get the, you would see them all the time like at various restaurants in the city. So uh, especially childhood obesity is a super complex topic. Um, people think that it is like just calories in, calories out, and childhood obesity is way more complex. In general, obesity is much more complex than that. And um, as we do this work, we're, again, that's how we try to recognize it. It's not just, you know, uh, what people eat, but it's like the environment that they live in and the way that they're able to access things that other people aren't. So I think it's just, you know, um, communities all over Chicago are, <laughs> uh, they're, yeah, I think it just shows how all of these um, issues kind of, I don't know, uh, build up on each other. So, yeah. Yeah, and I would imagine it's, there's also, you know, factors in like the amount of time people can spend on things like wellness or the access to quality ingredients. You know, you can't have a healthy lifestyle if you don't have time to sort of focus on having a healthy lifestyle. And even just what's available, like, for example, we're working right now in Big Marsh, um, which is like down way south. They don't in, in some of those areas, they don't even have grocery stores and they don't have CT. They don't have um, train stations. So you basically have to have a car or and it's not very I don't know if ever, anybody's ever biked there, but it's not the funnest place to bike around. And so and walking also, they don't have sidewalks that actually connect with neighborhoods. So how do you get, so it, 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 again, these environmental things that play into the way that people um, are able to access things and not access, not able to access things. So, yeah. Hi, I'm food security too. Um, I had another question, like with COVID and the demonstrations against police violence and anti-racism, um, have you all been doing any work through any of those initiatives on like open streets, or access to the parks and the lakefront? Um, does any of that, inter have, have you been doing any recent work on that side of things? Um, so because most of our work is driven by the community uh, or by communities, if communities tell us that that's not a priority for them, we, it's not that we don't, we ignore those things, it's just that they are kind of in the periphery. So for example, the communities that I work around, none of them live by the lake path. None of them, that's not even a concern of theirs. And for example, open streets um, in, uh, in a lot of these communities, they don't think that that's like their answer to their problem. So they, that's not, that's not like the focus of their, um, 
or there were is like they want like better lighting or like you know smoother sidewalks or some of the vacant lots to be cleaned up so <laughs> it's it's not that we want to ignore it it's just that we take what communities say as being more important than these other factors um, that may come at some point but right now communities haven't been telling me that that's something that they're prioritizing um, so with uh, police brutality and things like that it is something that we talk about often and in in our walkability survey assessment we do have questions around um, police presence and what communities feel so we do try to um, take in some of that perspective into the work that we do Well, thank you, Ruth. Um, we definitely um, enjoyed your presentation and we'll have more time to talk about that during our discussion piece at the very end of today's committee meeting. Uh, but we do have a, a final presentation by Kyra Woods on uh, Ready for 100% Chicago. So um, we'll now hand it over to Kyra for her presentation for the day. Awesome, thanks so much. Great, it is wonderful to be with you all this afternoon. It seems as if the sun is coming out a little bit, so that is a nice perk as well. But happy fall, <laughs> we're getting there. Um, again, my name is Kyra Woods and I am an organizer with our Sierra Club Illinois chapter. Um, and specifically, I have been supporting our Chicago is, well, our Ready for 100 campaign here in Chicago. And so I have had the pleasure of actually working with your very own Renee Patton from EESP um, in our coalition that has been also leading this work as well. So thanks for having me uh, with our, our conversation today and thanks to Renee for your hard work always. Next slide. Um, I wanted to start with just a little background. Um, some of you may be familiar with this campaign. Um, some, it may be entirely new. Uh, in Chicago last year in April, the city council passed a resolution unanimously to actually make a goal of 100% clean energy for Chicago's future. And in this resolution, um, we were able to articulate a few milestones uh, about how we should get there. Um, we didn't put a specific date on when we should be 100% quite yet, uh, but we at least wanted to start this conversation and ensure that the work that was being done is um, sensitive to communities' needs and their community goals as well. So back in April of last year, when we passed that resolution, it, we were the largest city to make that type of commitment at the time. Um, we were, Sierra Club was just one of 20 different groups that actually helped to pen the resolution that was um, initially passed. And I would really say that the messaging and our relationship with the mayor's office was stronger because of the diversity of our coalition that actually wrote the resolution. So some of the partners that were involved uh, were high school groups, churches, as well as other community-based partners as well, in addition to Sierra Club. Next slide, please. All right, so well, this- yeah, no problem. Uh, this is our uh, picture actually of the day we passed the resolution and we had a, a press conference as well at City Hall. Um, and just like really proud of our team and, and all the people who helped make that a reality last year and continue to be involved with this work. Go ahead. Okay, I wanted to definitely acknowledge that, you know, the, the journey to 100% in this conversation, A, is not particularly new, and B, wasn't just something that everybody jumped up and down and said, yeah, we are on the way, this is great. Um, there was like a very public moment that we had last year where um, Kim Wasserman, you can actually go to the next page for the, the, the quote, Kim Wasserman from the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization very clearly said in a press conference, we strongly oppose a premature commitment to a renewable energy goal for Chicago without an equal commitment to addressing the current environmental and public health threats on the city's south and west sides. And I think this moment was really important. Um, not that we had been um, dismissive of public health or racial equity in our conversations within the coalition, but I think it was really important for a public, a, a community-based organization to say, 
these things are linked and you cannot have these conversations without one another. Um, and so I think it, it served as a way to truly underscore that there is, there is some sequence here. Uh, I think R Ruth made a really great point in her presentation over and over again that these are compounding issues and we do ourselves a disservice in the name of equity or racial equity or you know diversity, equity and inclusion, whatever the title of the department or the team, if we don't understand this greater complexity um, and, and become so driven by simply one goal, we, we, we risk doing more harm than good. Um, and so we've had a number of environmental justice leaders and organizations work with us to say, hey, public health is critical to this as well, um, or these are some of the missteps that, that have happened in the past, and we need to be sure that this transition is not just about reaching 100%, but more about the journey to getting there. Um, and I think as a campaign and as a coalition, we've said um, it is, we, we're, we're, we're seeking to hold space and hold a conversation about how we power our city and who has power in our city. You can go to the next slide. All right, so, you know, many of you may be familiar already with the idea that equity is more than just an outcome. It truly, truly must be modeled throughout your process and practiced. Um, and it, it is, I appreciated um, a friend who said, practice makes improvement you know, that this is not simply like, ooh, we did it, it's a checkbox. It is iterative. It is something that we must wrestle with. And I think we're in a place even with this campaign, you know, this many years later, where we're, we're still wrestling with some things and, and always seeking to improve upon, um, upon our community engagement strategies and tactics. Um, and then this last point I did want to, to articulate we really value the diversity um, so that of our coalition and our partners, as well as our attendees and our participants in different events, so that when we do advocate, we are really bringing up stronger positions and issues um, and diverse decision makers into the room so that we're really coming up with, with something solid um, and, and not something to, to share and, and to, um, I don't know, just something that doesn't withstand. Uh, we, we risk just coming up with solutions that for the few. And we don't want that as a part of this. Uh, our transition to clean energy should be one that really doesn't uh, exacerbate the divide, but how can we serve the margins in a way that allows greater um, mobility and security in our, in our communities in Chicago and anywhere? All right, we can go to the next slide. So really quickly, I'll just, offer some bullet points on some topic areas that we've looked at and, and ideas that we've held true um, or held to maybe in our campaign work. <laughs> First was economic impact. Um, this is a picture of Naomi Davis on the left at a hiring hall at the Green Living Room um, over on community. And economic impact in this conversation is really big because this is an industry that is Yes, it is taking off, um, but there is an opportunity for some real economic um, progress. And, and as we are at the, the beginning of it, there's an opportunity to really put down some anchors to make it an accessible trade um, and about more than just installers for solar panels, but how do we create and incubate local businesses that are thinking about everything from energy efficiency to solar panels and making that accessible for a variety of economic groups. We can go to the next point, which is our health outcomes. So this map, many of you may be familiar with, um, this was produced in 2018 um, by NRDC and a number of other groups, including the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Um, but this map, I think, was like resonated very, um, very clearly throughout the environmental community and a number of others because this is showing a cumulative burden map. Um, and so this took into account not just environmental exposure, but some of the other uh, health and wellness factors that even, even Ruth mentioned in, in her presentation. And when you lay those on top of, of one another, where do we see the most vulnerability? Um, and also, as Ruth said, there's, there's a series of maps that we're, we're rather familiar with in Chicago and that frankly, my grandmother who grew up here is familiar with. And I think 
that is telling. How, 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 what are we really doing to shift the needle on that thing? Um, and so I think this was really a good map for us to say, look, even if we're in different silos or in different camps and asking people to kind of stay in their lane, it's important that we have a map like this to say, eyes on the prize, how are we really addressing you know, the toxic environmental exposures that are being felt in industrial corridors. You know, how are we ensuring that um, those who may not have access to the lakefront or the bike paths there do have access to green space and that, um, you know, the ways that we light those paths or still create safe spaces is, is a cumulative conversation. The next piece that we've been thinking about also is utility burdens. So you can go on to the next slide, Dustin. And this, um, I wanted to start with that cumulative burden map because then if you look at this map around electricity burden specifically, you'll notice again, our south and our west sides are experiencing some, some um, a greater impact. So this is specifically looking at um, though census tract, at the census tract level, excuse me, where the proportion of your annual income is is being used towards your electricity bills. So where are people paying more of their income on electricity? And so those tracks, those little, you know, shapes, because they're not all rectangles, where it is darker red, those are pockets where families or buildings are um, paying more on their electricity bills. What was interesting about this data set produced by GreenLink uh, Analytics is that they did this mapping for electricity, for gas, and for water, and then they did a composite as well for energy. And so with our Ready for 100 campaign, we said, hey, this is actually a really great quantitative piece of information that we could use as something to measure success by. It's not the only thing, but when it comes to going to 100% clean energy, how do we just not do this by having a conversation around solar panel pe penetration? How are we actually helping people um, in, in their day-to-day -day living? And utility burden is one of those factors. All right, I know we are a little pressed for time. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, and I wanted to simply say here that, you know, with our Ready for 100 campaign, writing the resolution, passing the resolution was only one piece of the, of the journey, right? In the resolution, we um, stated that three things should happen, that by the end of 2020, a transition plan should be put together, that by 2035, all buildings should be powered by 100% renewable energy, and that by 2040, all buses should be electrified. And so 2020 has thrown a wrench at everybody. Um, so we are not particularly on track for that one. Um, and we are really grateful though that there is a new chief sustainability officer at the city of Chicago and who seems who remains committed to making this uh, goal a reality. So we are still in communication with the mayor's office on that one. But these two pieces about building uh, buildings being powered by clean energy and the buses being electrified, it is really critical that those two, as well as the plan, be um, informed by local voices and by prioritizing those voices who have been greatly impacted. So we've tried to explore burden, benefit, and the opportunities for our Chicago residents, and we're, we're aiming to have those actually inform what this plan looks like. So um, I will wrap up in saying, maybe let's go to this slide. Yep. Um, we are hosting a series of uh, conversations. Right now they're in the digital space and we're, we're working to figure out a mirror in person as well. Um, but we are focusing on four pillars for this transition based on transition plans that we've seen in other cities as well as based on the conversation happening here in Chicago. We're focusing on long-term jobs. I do not know why this list only has ones, I apologize. <laughs> uh, but we're focusing on long-term jobs saving money, and so think along the lines of energy efficiency um, and decarbonizing our buildings. The third topic would be better health, um, and so back to the, that public health impact. And then the last session would will focus on electric transportation. 
So remember the resolution specifically tackles buses, um, but we also know that there is a conversation around electric private vehicles as well. So this series is intended to help us fulfill some of the language in our resolution about determining principles of a just transition and identifying key equity metrics. But we also want to begin building this public narrative that a clean energy transition is, um, is, is for environmental, economic, and health benefits as well. And then we're hoping to craft a framework, at least begin laying the foundation for a framework um, based on this model that we saw out of Detroit, hosted by a group called Solidarity. And I'll go ahead and drop that link in, the present, in our chat box as well so you can see what's inspired some of our work here in Chicago. Um, I don't think that we'll have time for it. I don't think you may have captured that like stay in connection with me, but when we send out the slides later, I'll make sure that it has my contact information and I can put that in the chat as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kyra. Uh, we learned so much today from your presentation. And Renee, thank you so much for introducing us to Kyra. Uh, we were so fortunate um, to learn a little bit more about Ready for 100 Chicago. Um, we, we do have some time for um, discussion. We wanted to also leave a, a couple minutes for you all to ask Kyra questions, but we are definitely almost out of time. Um, so what we'll do is um, we'll have 10 minutes in a breakout room discussion. We'll be split into two groups. I will be in one group and Dustin will be in the other group. Um, we'll have 10 minutes to talk about um, today's uh, presentations. We'll, we'll discuss a little bit more about equity and how we're advancing equity in our respective organizations. Then we'll have a minute or two to report back to the main group. Um, I do want to mention that Elliot um, Hartstein is here today, our uh, chair. I want to acknowledge that he is present with us today and uh, thank you for, um, for joining us. So I will then... Um, put us into two breakout rooms. And so we'll have about 10 minutes. All right, I have launched them. fire <laughs> all right hi everyone it looks like the timer is set to 20 minutes so i, I need to adjust that <laughs> but um thank you all for joining us for today's citizens advisory committee meeting um our theme for today's meeting focused on um equity and so we wanted to talk a little bit more about how we're advancing equity in our respective organizations um we've had um three amazing presentations today that focused on equity at CMAP, um, equity as it relates to walkability and equity as it relates to energy. And so uh, my first question um, that we'd like to present to the group is, in hearing today's presentation, was there anything that stood out to anyone? Um, if so, what particularly? I like the uh, the at the presentation at the end, Kira, when uh, just how I think it was Little Village and the person stood up and, you know, instead of making sort of a blanket vow to do something that they might or might not do, you know, taking a stand on something that they believed in, you know, versus sort of just adding their name to a list of some vague, you know, vow. So to me, they had like a clear understanding of what they had in mind and, you know, kind of put themselves out there for it, so. Anything else? Um, yes, I think they need to have in Illinois a deposit like per can or per I don't Let's know if we lost your audio there. Yeah, I know. I'm having problems with my charger, too. They need to have plastic bottle deposits, tin deposits, and glass, too. Who 
This is Thomas Gary from the uh, Treasurer's Office. If I can just say that I think that uh, having that direction and guidance, as well as the attention from the top, uh, you know, I think Michelle, you talked about, you know, how this, you know, is being supported by Aaron, by the executive director, uh, when it's being supported by the chief executive of an agency, then it, then it matters. And it matters down the line. People get, people understand down the line, staff understands, okay, this is a thing that matters as well as your external uh, partners or your external uh, uh, relationships, they also understand that it matters. Uh, I'll try to be real quick. Uh, my boss, the, the state treasurer, uh, came in uh, with an understanding that, hey, we have to do a much better job at making sure that um, fund managers that are actually handling and investing state funds represent and look like uh, the state of Illinois. And at that point, uh, less than 3% of funds under management were being managed by minority owned, women owned, uh, veteran owned, disabled owned firms. That was 2015. Uh, 2020, beginning of 2020, that number is a little under 80%. Uh, I wanna say about 75, because he has made it clear this is a priority for him. He has made it clear to the deputy treasurer, this is going to be a priority for you. Mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fund managers themselves recognize this. Uh, he's also taken, it's not just saying, hey, we want to do this, but also trying to figure out, okay, well, are there barriers to getting more people in the pipeline? What are those barriers? How do we uh, work through that. So uh, I, I very much take in uh, what your organizations have been uh, doing, and I really am pointing it to and am thinking about that uh, uh, direction that's coming from leadership. I'll pass that back over. I can just kind of piggyback yeah. on onto that for a second. Um, you know, I think that that sort of stood out to me as well. I think mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I'm running for county board is because when I um, you know, when I kind of first entered all of this, what I learned was that the DuPage County Board is, um, you know, it was extremely um, uh, homogenous, you know, in a variety of ways in terms of, um, you know, ethnicity, background, um, you know, occupation, party, um, gender, I mean, in, in basically all the ways it was like, you know, one um, view was represented over and over again. And, you know, the more we talk about mm -hmm. sort of why representation matters, I mean, these things are kind of cropping up. And, and so, um, yes, I just kind of wanted to sort of underscore what you're saying, Thomas, and say um, that I feel like th the more we talk about this, the more it becomes difficult to, to overlook the fact that um, we just need regular people from a broad swath to, to sort of step up and represent in, and not only in you know, local government, but mm. um, on all kinds of committees like this. So um, I was heartened to hear that. And I, um, I'm happy that the conversation is just happening so often in so many places. This is Garland Armstrong speaking. I was in the 80s. I used to live in New York area and they had to deposit aluminum cans, plastic, um, bo plastic bottles and glass too. And they mm. brought in good revenue and the state kept up with it, with the data of it. And I would like to know when will the state of Illinois be able to keep, when will they start this? Because they did it in the eighties and when did they discontinue it? So they should get it back up again so they can have the revenue for the state of Illinois and the data because we definitely, since we feel like we're gonna be on the deficit, why not use that like my wife says, so that we can stay, still stay afloat and still be on the surplus of it so that we don't have to be on the deficit by refund by getting more refunds from it, and then we'll be we'll be we'll stay afloat and balance and balance the budget instead of going on the downward part on the deficit because I think that that should be good enough to have the the revenue from refunding the cans plastic the drink plastic like um from diets and and then rec beverages and then also from the glass too so we can have a good revenue part and make sure we'll be on the surplus again. So 
if New York did it in the 80s, why not Illinois too? It's long overdue mm -hmm. to do it because it's time now. This is the 21st century. So I did it when I was living in there in the 80s, in the 20th century. And we should do it right now in the 21st century so we can make sure to get the revenues and the data to keep up to date on it and let the and the revenue will say we're finally balancing our budget. Thank you, Garland. And I know we're 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 pretty short on time. We probably have less than two minutes left. Um, and just looking at the time. One question we also wanted to ask you all is are there any initiatives you'd like CMAP to support or help promote in sort of thinking about this question around equity? I, I like the community-driven. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Heather. Let's not. <laughs> we need more low-income housing because <laughs> Illinois fails at it, especially the Chicago area, because. A lot of people with disabilities and low income people, they cannot even afford an apartment because it costs so much to live in the Chicago region. That's a good point. Yeah, if, if I could piggyback on that, I would also say that, you know, I know with a lot of new developments, you know, the builders are actually buying out of the affordable housing requirements and they're paying to have it put elsewhere, you know, which limits your you know, mixed use communities and neighborhoods and that sort of thing. Um, either upping the requirement there or, you know, in some areas forcing them not to be able to do that. So I think, you know, going from sort of a NIMBY approach to a YIMBY and, and, and uh, convincing folks that that's the right way to do it. But um, also, you know, I know at least in my ward, they're doing the not only community driven zoning, but community budgeting as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I would love to see that community-driven zoning mm. uh, approach. And, you know, and I don't, who knows if it's successful yet, just sort of applied in more wards, whether or not, and, you know, my alderman is a little more on the, uh, you know, I would say, I, <laughs> I'm not going to call her a socialist, but more of a <laughs> progressive there. You know, you don't have to be progressive to do something like that, you know, and just kind of open up that conversation. That was a long-winded. No, that's version. great. That's great. Community-driven zoning approach. Thank you, Daniel. So we have about, and I'm looking at my timer, another minute left. Um, any final comments? Um, maybe if there's anyone that may want to talk about ways they're incorporating equity in their per, uh, respective organization. But we have about a minute left. Yeah, I was just thinking that I'd like to see a similar kind of analysis done of the seven county um, CMAP area, mm -hmm. because with some of the demographic changes uh, that were implemented by Daly, uh, I think that we have lost track of, of where a lot of uh, minority communities are. Uh, and, and that includes other ethnicities as well that have kind of been dispersed. And I would like to see a bigger picture uh, of understanding because it's not just a Chicago issue, it's, it's the whole area. Thank you, Faye. Wonderful. All right, so we'll now go back to the main room and have a brief discussion on what we talked about in our breakout room. So I'm gonna move everybody back to the main room.